Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Richard Clayton from um, uh, Cambridge University. Uh, Richard has been has a, a long and distinguished career fighting, as he terms it, um, internet wickedness for quite some time. Um, he's been active in the IS and the um, information security, you know, space for for quite a while. But went back to academia in 2000, and as he says, um, decided to stay there because it's it's way more fun than uh, than working. So he's going to tell us today about you know a suite of work that he's been doing for for quite some time, and that a number of us have been following with with, with great interest, which is what we know about fishing websites and um, um, and no one knows more about them I guess than, than Richard okay thanks thanks uh, this is joint work with Tyler Moore who was at uh, Cambridge uh, and is now at Harvard and Henry Stern who works for Cisco Iron Board and you'll see his data turning up later on in the talk uh, it's what we now know about phishing websites because I want to stress that we're learning more all the time and some of the stuff which we knew two years ago is wrong so what do I mean by phishing uh, I mean the capture of user credentials through impersonation. So if you go back 15 years or so, people pretended to be AOL sysops in order to get free AOL accounts off other people. Uh, but since 2003, it's been all about money. And since the banks are where all the money is, it's been mainly about banks. Now there is phishing for all sorts of other stuff as well. Uh, auction sites, payment processors, Habo. If you have children, you'll know what Habo is, uh, etc. But the the common theme is that there's some way of turning the credentials into money uh, and I'm going to say banks throughout most of the uh, uh, talk because most of the phishing is in fact about banks. The losses, uh, people always say two billion a year. This is basically rubbish uh, and we know that from good work here from, from people at uh, Microsoft. Uh, essentially these are figures which are scaled up from phone interviews. They're extremely dubious. What we do know fairly solidly is that in the UK, uh, 53 million pounds, that's about getting on for 100 million dollars, uh, was lost in 2008. That's, a, that's a distinctly up from previous years. Uh, the U there's a lot of phishing against UK banks. Obviously the US is bigger, but the two billion looks very hard to stand up. If you go and look in other countries, then somewhere like Germany, there's almost no phishing. It's almost all keyloggers. Uh, if you go and look in Brazil, it's, it's mainly malware. So there's all sorts of other sorts of attacks going on which are getting hold of credentials. So phishing is, is very much specialised in particular countries. In some places you see two-factor being used in order to try and stop capture of credentials and then using them next week. Uh, but in practice it doesn't help very much because people just do real-time attacks and capture the credentials and use them immediately. Now, Phishing is absolutely fantastic for academics because as soon as you've got three emails in your inbox, you know all about it. So everybody then takes their expertise as an academic and uses it to deal with uh, phishing. So you can see people using, trying to understand the psychology of the phishing emails, people tr trying to block the stuff because they're into blocking spam, people trying to detect the websites in various ways, people hacking around browsers and so on and so forth. And we're no different. What we do is security economics in Cambridge, so we've applied security economics to all of this. And essentially, we've assumed that phishing is going to go on, so what we're interested in doing is getting better measures of the impact and assessing whether or not the countermeasures which people are putting in place actually work and looking at the incentives which mean that they don't work. So what we're interested in doing is developing ways in to produce better incentives for dealing with phishing. But there's a real problem with this because Academics and these sort of real world problems don't get on very well because if you write a paper about phishing then it has to be novel because it won't get accepted to a conference unless it has some sort of novelty to it. And PhDs have to be, in, well in the jargon for Cambridge, a contribution. So what tends to happen is academics come in, look at phishing, pick some low hanging fruit and then they move on. And that means that all sorts of errors in early papers often go uncorrected. Uh, it's partly that the early papers tend to be wrong because there isn't peer review or any works when you've got peers who actually understand the issues and nobody really understood phishing until relatively recently. There's a natural tendency if you're an academic not to report failures or you try something and it doesn't work. That's not really a very good paper usually. 
uh, and there's a natural tendency if you've written the paper two years ago and it's wrong to hold up your hand and say it was wrong it's all a mistake well I'm trying to be an exception here we wrote papers several years ago they're wrong we understand it a lot better now uh, and I'm going to try and put across in this talk what we now understand so if you go back and read our earlier papers they're wrong right uh, I've been trying to be really good and put uh, some dates on these things because fishing does evolve over time not only does our understanding improve over time but what we actually but but it, the bad guys are evolving as well so I've tried to put on the dates so you know roughly when these things apply to in general I try to present most of this stuff is still true but some of the percentages will change over time once upon a time fishing was all about uh, spelling Barclays and putting a Q in the middle of it so you think it was Barclays if you read it really quickly uh, they're quite unusual these misleading domain names uh, about three quarters of all sites are basically hacked end user machines where people have compromised either a particular username within that uh, within a, uh, a Unix style machine or they've compromised the whole machine so they can put in URLs anywhere in the uh, in the, tr in the uh, directory tree that they wish uh, and then you get free web hosting where you can go along and get free web hosting from Yahoo, from Alice.it in Italy, from smtp.ru or whatever, you, all you've got to do is produce your name and you get some free web space on, on the internet and the really important thing in all of these things is that you get a bank name in there Yes? I'm trying to ask, uh, are these percentages based on number of sites or uh, traffic? Uh, th these percentages are in the number of sites. In general, we don't know very much about traffic. I'll present what we know about traffic later on. Uh, way down the bottom, I, uh, in the small print at the bottom, you see uh, Rockfish, which is about 4% of sites in January 2008, uh, and Fast Flux and another group which we call ARC, for not a very good reason. Uh, and basically, they look like the small print here. As you'll see in a couple of slides, they're very much not the small print. Uh, what's really important to see here is that the phishing guys believe that it doesn't matter where you put the bank name provided you put the bank name in there somewhere then it will succeed and fool people into thinking it's a bank site. It will be very interesting to see whether or not the recent changes to IE8 whereby you can actually see the domain name leaping out at you off the page whether or not that makes any difference to what they're doing. Now Rockfish uh, who are called this because they originally stuck all of their uh, phishing pages under the slash rock directory and then when that became too easy to uh, spot they stuck it under the r1 directory uh, these days they don't bother they just stick it at the root uh, work entirely differently they're not compromising machines and putting up web pages on those machines what they're doing is they're arranging uh, for a machine to run an http proxy uh, and then they pick some random domain name which doesn't infringe any trademark at all uh, and then they produce this rather distinctive or classically this distinctive URL style where they have some random bit which looks which basically can be different every time which is there we believe because they think it gets them through uh, email filters there's then the bank name because that's the really important thing about a phishing website is that you mention the bank name so you know it's genuine then you get the random uh, uh, domain which is very hard for anybody to understand that that might be wicked uh, and then you get the actual web pages now part of the point about rockfish is depending what comes after the slash then they can attack multiple banks in parallel uh, and they pick uh, sequences after the slash which resemble the sort of directory structure you'd see on real uh, the real bank website uh, and since they've mentioned the bank name then of course you know it's genuine uh, and they just pick those things like lof80.info completely at random as far as we can tell uh, and that makes it hard to explain to people that what matters here is that the domain needs to be removed I, because all, the, all you're actually seeing here is a proxy and as soon as that proxy is removed rockfish were capable of moving to another proxy from about February 2007 and basically exclusively uh, since for about a year now uh, they've been using a scheme which is called fast flux which is essentially also its proxy machines but instead of having a static proxy which sits there for weeks on end until somebody removes it uh, essentially they arrange uh, for the proxy to change every 20 minutes or so 
And because, uh, because they don't sort of pre-qualify the proxies in order to make sure that they're stable uh, and work well, they resolve the uh, host name to five or ten different IP addresses in parallel. So we now see five or ten different IP addresses and 20 minutes later another five or ten diff different IP addresses and essentially as far as we can see over long periods no repeats. And essentially they're using their botnet and they're picking simple single machines out of the botnet uh, in, in groups of five or ten to be relays in order to relay the traffic back to the machine behind the so-called mothership. Uh, and that basically means that the only way you can tackle this is to get the domain name suspended because there's absolutely no way that you can get a compromised machine cleaned up inside of 20 minutes. And even if you could, then, then it, they just change in 20 minutes' time to another, another proxy. So if we actually look about how effective this is by getting some real-world real, real world measurements, because what we do is we uh, collect lots of uh, data about phishing websites and we measure how long they're active for, then we get the following fine table. If you just look down the, uh, the mean first, um, then basically free web hosting uh, in this period lasted about 48 hours before it was removed, but the median was zero i.e. half of the sites were removed before we could actually measure the fact they were up. Uh, but that's the average. If we actually look at the distinction here between whether or not the brand owner knows about the site or not, then if the brand owner knows about the phishing website, in fact the mean is 4.3 hours, but if the brand owner doesn't know about it, it's 4.3 days. Okay, so. Uh, as soon as the brand owner becomes aware of the phishing website, it comes down very fast. But before the brand owner is aware of it, then it stays up. Now, the really great thing about this is when we first started doing measurements uh, way back in 2007, we didn't understand this, as a result of which we were quoting the, the overall mean figures of takedown time was around two days. And the industry looked at us and said, you're wrong. We take down websites much faster than that. And we said, oh, well, there's a very, very long tail. It must be the selective memory. You just forget about the ones which were really bad. But this is the real explanation. The reason that they think that takedown time is a few hours is because they only take down the sites they know about, whereas we're measuring all websites. Exactly the same pattern on compromised machines, distinction between the takedown times of when the brand owner is aware or not aware. But the rockfish domains... Right, and at the period in January 2008 when we measured this, we were seeing both classic rockfish with single static proxies which stayed there for some time, and fast flux domains with this fast flux ever changing every 20, 20 minutes or so. Uh, then as you can see, uh, the, the mean takedown time is 70 or 96 hours depending, uh, and the median time for takedown is about a day. And that reflects the fact you have to go to the registrar rather than getting hold of the person who owns the machine. So I understand completely that when you refer to brand owner here, you're talking about the bank, not the hosting provider. I'm talking about the bank, yes, because the bank has an incentive to get the site removed. Now, in fact, the puzzle here is if the brand owner doesn't know about it, why is it ever removed? And we think the answer to that, well, we don't know, right? It's one of the great things we don't know. Uh, we think the answer is a lot of stuff is reported directly to the, uh, to the site rather than being reported to the bank for the bank to do something about it. Also, some of the uh, hosting companies and so forth do their own scanning and look for, their, and look for stuff anyway. How did you know they knew about the site? Sorry? How did you know that ah, they knew the next slide. Now, what actually happens in the industry is most of the banks now outsource takedown to specialist companies, of which there are about five in the industry. And these companies compete not only on how, how much they charge and how fast they are, but they also compete on how, much, how many websites they know about. And uh, they get the data from various consolidated industry lists, in particular run, the one run by the Anti-Phishing Working Group, but they also run lots of spam traps of their own. They buy up old ISPs, old domain names, that sort of thing, run their own honeypots essentially, and they look at all the email turning up to those and pick out all the phishing emails and pick out the URLs. So, but they compete on this information, so though they're delighted to give it to us because we're academic researchers, they don't give it to each other. So we know about more websites than any particular company in the industry does because all of the companies, almost all the companies share information with us. Okay, so 
Basically, that's what we're measuring here. We know about sites which they don't know about. Now, we wrote a paper about this, one of the, you know, one of the multiple papers we've written. Uh, we, we drew attention to this and we said, you should really share information with each other. It would be a really good thing to do. And they don't like that conclusion. They prefer the alternative conclusion, which is the bank should hire all of them. <laughs> Here's some data, uh, one of the oldest sets of data we have, from spring 2007, uh, which shows the takedown time on uh, different free websites. Now, this all looks very convincing. So Yahoo, absolutely fantastic. Their median takedown time is 6.9 hours. But this is really old data. This is before we understood about the business, about whether or not people knew about this. Because in fact, Yahoo's takedown time is 20 minutes. Apart from when something goes wrong, and either a report to them gets stuck in one of their spam traps, and they assure me they've fixed this, uh, alternatively, nobody tells them at all, but we just see the feed and it goes past and nobody ever bothers to tell Yahoo about it at all, as a result of which you get these very long tails. And the other thing is that of this data, almost all of the sites on DoraMail, Pocket.ru, Alice.it and so forth were eBay, right? Um, except Yahoo was, a, had, was hosting all sorts of other banks as well. So, we don't know, even when you measure this, as to whether or not what you're actually measuring here is eBay's effectiveness or the actual particular takedown company's effectiveness. And there's a further problem, which is this, this is what the takedown time was for Alice.it. And you will see that in April, the takedown time for sites at Alice.it was over 500 hours for a particular website then. And it drops away over time. And what's actually happening here is that during April, they are not taking the sites down at all, and therefore the sites stay up all the way until about the first week of May, when suddenly enough people shout at them that they remove all of the sites which have been up for the last three weeks. And thereafter, they remove sites fairly promptly. And we call this the gaining of clue, which is basically when people first started pushing phishing websites on Addis.it, they didn't know what to do, so they left them up whilst they thought about it and doubtless talked to the local police and talked to people. And eventually enough people discussed it with them and said, you are doing the wrong thing, you must remove these websites. And eventually they took them all down. But the really cute thing about this is we can see exactly the same pattern for Hong Kong domains and for Chinese domains, in fact one particular registrar in China. Exactly the same pattern, which is early on, they don't know what to do, and eventually they remove all of the websites. And after that, they're with the program and they remove sites fairly quickly. So depending when, when in time you look at a particular set of figures, you may get completely misleading views as to what the mean and median is because the thing is not in steady state. Is it just coincidence that everyone's getting a clue in April and May <laughs> of, uh, this year? Or? Uh, no, that just basically reflects the, the time period of our study. So we're basically seeing the same effect in the study for different places. Right? Uh, given there are 3,000 registrars or so, uh, and several hundred free, free websites at any point when you do a study, you're almost certainly going to see this effect. Because, of course, the bad guys like it when the sites stay up for a long period, so they're continually evolving. There's no point putting websites on Alice.it if they can re re be removed within a couple of hours, or on Yahoo if they're removed in 20 minutes. Right? Whereas if you can find a new web hosting site that doesn't know what to do, where the community doesn't know the, the, the phone number, the mobile, the cell phone number of the uh, CEO to get him out of bed in the middle of the night and say, there's another one, do something about it, right? There's a real advantage here to moving on to the bad guys. So, quick question for you. So this was sites that they learned about that they took down. Yes. How would this look for sites you knew about were fishing? <clears throat> that they never took down. This is in fact all sites, and to some, um, and certainly the Hong Kong ones are mainly fast flux and, uh, or, and rockfish uh, domains. Uh, and as we'll see later on, everybody knows about those sites, and therefore there is very much less of this impact of who knows about what. Because everybody knows about those, uh, the fast flux and the rockfish uh, domains because uh, they basically send out so much email that, that nobody can miss it. And, and you'll, we'll see some data on that in a few slides' time. Well, how about like bulletproof hosting where they use ignore? Uh, bullet, bulletproof is, is essentially uh, 
when people say bulletproof, they either mean stuff hosted on botnets and therefore you have to attack the domain name, or alternatively they're talking about registrars who are deliberately not getting clue and are deliberately leaving the sites up. I, uh, I don't have any graphs showing sort of lifetime of stuff on, say, Mercola or whatever. It'd be a little complicated because, in fact, Mercola say they move things around, as I understand it. They didn't just, it's just they pretended to take things down and move them. They didn't, uh, they just didn't, didn't in practice remove them. Sorry? What year were those? Charts? Uh, that, these are from 2007. Uh, so these days I would expect these people to have a clue. Okay, one of the other things we did is we discovered that quite a lot of the compromised hosts had Webalizer statistics pages which were world readable. And therefore we could actually go and look at their daily totals of how many uh, <laughs> visitors they'd had yesterday which was generally because these were semi-abandoned site, sites, only sort of 20 or 30 visitors, which were probably just mainly search engines coming past uh, indexing the sites, and then suddenly you see this huge spike in activity when a phishing web page was put on there. And therefore we could actually go and look at the totals of how many people visited the sites uh, and extract from those how many people went through uh, the pages all the way to the end. Because a typical phishing website, you see one page, it asks you to fill in your uh, bank account details, and then it may move on to a second one where they try their luck and get you to fill in uh, your name, address, social security number, inside leg measurement and everything else they can think of. Uh, and then there's a third page which says thank you very much. And we were interested in how many people reached the last page. Uh, and basically by finding uh, quite a lot of these uh, Webalizer sites, we were able to produce some statistics on how many visitors they had. Uh, and it turned out that some of the sites also not only emailed off the results of who was compromised, but they also stored them on the website in a flat file where we could actually read them. So you could go to a phishing website and you could find out how many people had given away their credentials that day by actually fetching the credentials yourself. Uh, and quite what we found quite interesting was about half of the people who filled in the data had filled in their name as die spammer die. Mm -hmm. right, or given their address as um, imaginative places like you know, the Mr. M. Mouse of Epcot or whatever, or uh, uh, one really lovely one which stuck in my memory, which was uh, somebody who claimed to live at 7 Vagina Avenue. Uh, so uh, about 50%, we reckoned, of the uh, figures, or of the data filled in was in fact rubbish. Uh, so we were then able to do a sum. So basically, we knew how many websites there were and how long they stayed up for, which was fairly robust data. We knew from the Webalizer sites, which we waved our hands and said, well, perhaps that applies to all sites. We knew roughly how many visitors there were. We knew how many people actually filled in their details, and hence we could crunch everything, uh, and we could work out what the losses were from all of this. Uh, and we used the Gartner figure, which we have great deal of doubt about as to how many how much money per victim was actually lost as in completely lost not uh, not um, recouped uh, and hence we calculated the fishing industry was about 178 million dollars a year which is kind of a disappointment because it was nothing like two billion uh, but equally it wasn't sort of one million from our figures now the interesting thing about this is that uh, if we actually turn this into a percentage of users, then this was about 0.34% of US websites. Now, it's slightly dodgy using just US because some of these figures are international, but the majority of these sites are, are where you, at this period were US banks. And uh, uh, Florencia and Hurley from, uh, from this parish, by a completely different mechanism, by looking at how many people used the same password on more than one website, which they did by looking at data from an experimental toolbar uh, as part of IE, they ended up with a figure of 0.40%, which is remarkably close. And the interesting thing is that both of these figures are from completely different experimental methods, but they're way out of line with what Gartner is measuring for overall fraud rates, which they reckon is now up to about 2.8% which makes us even more worried about the, the Gartner figures in terms of their validity. Now, I'd be the first to say that the, the, the 4 on 0.34 is completely unjustified, and probably the 3 is a bit unjustified as well. Uh, but equally, it is remarkable how close comp two completely separate ways of measuring this have come out. 
In fact, we didn't actually realize that until we gave, both gave papers on the same morning uh, at a conference uh, and ended up sitting in the corridor turning these into percentages and realizing quite how close our numbers were. As a result of this, the figures I told you earlier about the fact that people aren't sharing information, by using this uh, measure of how much loss there is from having an extra hour of a website being up in terms of how many, how many visitors there are, we can turn these, the fact that people aren't sharing data into actual, actual losses. Uh, and if we crunch all of this, we ended up with a figure of about $163 million, $166 million over six months. Now, these are for two particular takedown companies who are completely different sizes. Right? Uh, uh, company A, which I'm not allowed to name, basically has a whole lot of national banks. Uh, there's a large number of uh, attacks on them and so forth, and they miss a fair proportion of all of those phishing attacks. Company B has some very small banks and credit unions as their customers, uh, and their coverage is rather better, uh, but there's all sorts of structural reasons why that would be. So don't use this table in order to pick company B as being who missed who missed a few websites, but not all that many, right? They basically had a completely different problem to solve. What the paper shows, and the paper has lots and lots more detail and all of the caveats about this, but basically what this paper shows is that, there, that we do have this, people don't know about things. They don't know, they don't know about websites which should be taken down, and that actually costs people, real people, real money, and therefore they should be sharing data better. Now, one of the questions we asked ourselves is how do people find these insecure machines in order to compromise? Now, traditionally, this was done by scanning. What you did is compromise one machine, and from there you did a scan for somewhere else. You want to ask a question, Sean? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so the actual values, what the bank estimates? The, the actual yeah. values are the number of... Uh, is the lifetime of the websites which we actually measured in the real world. If they had shared information in such a way that the websites were removed instantaneously once they knew about them, then, the, then basically we'd have ended up with 40% uh, of the lifetimes for A's banks. And that's based on the 572 per... Uh, and, and that's turned into numbers, into money by using the 572 figure. Right, so if you don't believe the 572 figure, then those numbers become smaller. I, and, you know, in these days, the bank's losing billions. Well, you know, what's 3.5 million? Who cares, right? Uh, but, um, you know, billion here, million there, million there, it all adds up in the end. But also, the 572 number, I mean, it's a Gartner number, which is, I mean, it comes from a survey of users imputing how much they thought the bank lost, right? They're, yes. not, they're not reporting how much they lost. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're if, if you don't like the 572 yeah. number, you prefer $200, then... then, then re make those numbers go downwards, right? But the real message is uh, if you just ignore the dollar numbers and just look at the, uh, the rather darker uh, time values, these websites are staying up longer. So, now when you presented this to banks, I'm assuming some banks... I presented this to banks, yes. It's also making the argument there's, a, there's an ROI to them to hire every takedown company out there well, the, the, the takedown <laughs> companies believe the banks should hire every takedown company, but equally the banks are the people paying the, uh, writing the contracts and, and paying the money, so the banks could equally say to their takedown company, uh, we, we will only hire services off you if you share data, right? Uh, and I don't care how you do it, and if it costs you money, that fair, so be it, and maybe we'll pay you a little bit more for your, the contract this year because you're going to have to go out and buy data off other people, but we insist you share. If I was a banker, that's what I'd be doing from this data. I'd be saying, I insist you share. I don't care how you do it. But in the short term, you're also making the comment of, hey, I can save more money if I hire, hire everybody. If you hire everybody, then, then every time we've looked at data, well, and you'll see the data again when we look at the iron port data in a couple of slides' time, every time we look at a new source of data, we discover that they know about some phishing which nobody else knows about. Okay? There is... Uh, though the APWG feed is wonderful and is full of a lot of data, right, it is not 100% of what is going on. Everybody has something to bring to the party. Everybody should be trying to share. And banks don't go back to the, all the companies and say, hey, 
we're not doing a blanket contract. We're going to pay per transaction per first takedown. Well, the, the banks have all sorts of different contracts with the takedown companies. Uh, I know probably know more about that than I'm allowed to say when somebody's recording me. So the question is, like, do we have access to how much of the banks pay to these companies? Because that puts a cap on the, how much the bank is losing, right? Because if the bank could hire the second company for a million and the bank doesn't, that means that the additional thing that the bank would get from that company is being, the bank is losing less than one million from that. Yeah, it, it, there's kind of a diminishing returns here. As you keep on hiring people, you're going to get lower and lower amounts, and therefore you probably have to uh, pay attention to how much you're picking up. Uh, certainly the uh, takedown companies compete in terms of how many sites they're taking down and, and so forth. Uh, they'll often go and remove, if they want to pitch for a bank's business, they'll go and remove some sites and then go along to the bank and say, look, look what we did for you for free. Wouldn't you like to buy hire our services for real? Right, so there's a lot of entrepreneur activity going on here. Right, but, um, and much of this I can't see. I, I can see what comes in the feeds from the various companies. I can measure the takedown times. Um, one of the more subtle questions, which I'm not really going to have time to go into today, is whether or not we're doing ourselves any favors by removing these websites, or whether or not if we reduce the churn, maybe uh, everybody's spam filters could catch up, and therefore there'd be very much diminishing returns uh, from the from the longer lifetimes. It's not entirely clear. The longer lifetimes at the moment definitely means more visitors. Right? Whether or not that's true in the long term as people's browser toolbars improve and people's spam filters improve is, is less clear. As I said, uh, machines traditionally are found by scanning. You compromise one machine and then you go and find some more. Uh, but one of the things we did for the Webalizer data, which we collected for the, for the other purpose, is one of the things Webalizer does is it tells you which search terms were used to find your site, which they do basically by looking. Uh, the search engine tends to, if you click through from the search engine, then you tend to get the search terms in the referrer string, because that's the way search engines work. As a result of which, we were able to see what searches were being used to find these sites. We did hand categorization of a very large number of terms, most of which were fairly obvious as to whether or not uh, what sort of search they were. So people were searching on sort of uh, blue shampoo or something and finding a blue shampoo website, that was fine, we just ignored that. Lots of searches were for MP3s, people trying to find world readable MP3s lying around on the web. Uh, but some of the searches were extremely exotic, and the three examples up there, uh, the first one of which is looking for a specific vulnerability in a particular PHP product. PHP uh, piece of software. The second one is looking for a site which has already been compromised. We assume uh, because if somebody else can compromise it, then I can too. So what they're looking for is a PayPal website, which is just lying around, a PayPal phishing website, because there should only be one web, web page on the, uh, uh, on the internet which starts off Welcome PayPal as the title. Right, but in fact, there are thousands of them because there are lots of phishing websites for PayPal. And the last one is a search looking for a, a, web, a machine which has been compromised where people have left a PHP shell, which is basically uh, it's a, when you compromise a website, you upload this program called a shell, uh, and then basically you've got effectively command line access so that you can upload more files, you can hunt around, it's got little buttons so you can go searching for passwords and all, all really cute sort of things. Uh, and if you, uh, lots of these are world readable and lots of them are accessible by anybody who turns up because although you can set passwords on these shells, most of the bad guys don't bother because they think they're invisible. But the search engines find them and therefore you can find them by going and searching in, searching in a search engine for them. Uh, and when we looked at a whole lot of Webalizer logs last year, we found ne nearly 2,500 domains where we had world readable logs of which 53% we could find one or more uh, of these wicked search terms. Uh, sometimes they're called Google Docs in a slightly different context. And in 25 of these cases, we actually had enough data because there were multiple compromises that we can actually say for sure that the search immediately preceded the compromise. We assume that for the other 1,320, the search preceded the compromise. It's just we can't, because we're only seeing data on a 24-hour basis, 
uh, every 24 hours. We can't necessarily say that for sure. Uh, but we think that almost certainly the, the other cases that we, we're sure about it. Uh, and basically, you can see the totals up there of the different sorts of searches. So basically, looking for vulnerabilities is far more popular than looking for shells, but people are out there looking for shells. When we started looking at phishing web pages on the same website, which were more than a week apart, right, which we thought was likely to be a different attacker, we're just waving our hands here, we're not sure, we think so, then we found that 9% uh, of all of these sites were recompromised within a month, rising to 20% within six months. But for the sites where we had webalizer data, right, showing uh, at all, then it was 15% rising to 33%. Now that may just be that if you've got the sort of website where your webalizer data is world readable, then you're just less secure anyway. But if the evil search terms could be found in the webalizer data, then it was even higher. And for those sites, then the recompromise rate after six months was 48%. Right? And that's statistically significant. Uh, you have to take Tyler's word for it. Tyler does all of the statistics and so forth, but he swears to me that it's statistically significant, so believe it. Uh, and the take home from this is that the, the bad guys are using search, or as we call it in the rest of the world, Google, uh, and finding the same websites as each other. So independent people using search, all finding the same set of machines which are in the top, top 10 hits. And the websites are being cleaned up, but the underlying problem isn't being fixed. So somebody else who does a search in a few months' time finds exactly the same website and compromises it and sticks a new phishing website on it on some different path. This is really depressing if you're interested in how well people clean up machines. Right? This is good data. Even if you're not interested in phishing, this is good data about how bad we are at cleaning up machines when they're compromised. Yes, sir. To know if, um, if you've done any analysis to see which search engines are better at... Uh, uh, we, yes, if, um, if you look at the paper, you'll find that um, it's worth... At that point, we looked at Google and Yahoo. I'm afraid we didn't look at it, uh, the local one here. Uh, and uh, we found that... Um, there was a remarkable lack of intersection between them. It's really worthwhile trying more than one search engine. You'll get a lot more sites to knock over. So if you're a bad guy listening to this, multiple search engines. But if you're a good guy, isn't there an opportunity to populate the search cache with you know, garbage honeypot accounts to make it so that... Um... If you wanted to run a honeypot and you knew somebody on the Bing team, then you could do all sorts of really cool things, yes. Uh, uh, so that's something perhaps we'll talk to somebody about later today. Uh, but... Um, the other thing is uh, the people around honeypots are very interested in this research. They're asking what, what are people searching for because I'll arrange to be uh, top of the list for those search terms. So everyone's real keen on that. Uh, so it's really quite interesting stuff. Um, and uh, it's co probably quite interesting to the search engine people as to why there is so little overlap. Right? Because usually you expect a very high overlap. But here's a rather specialist search and the overlap is very poor. So there's kind of an interesting question why that might be. Now, uh, we have to look at email spam data. I've been talking about websites, but what actually drives people to phishing websites is, in fact, email spam. So, assuming that all email spam is equally convincing, which is rubbish, but it's, it's a starting position, uh, then it means that if you measure spam volumes, you roughly know how much, where the losses are going. So, we looked at one week's worth of brand new sites from end of last September. Uh, which we found there were 4,000 websites and 120 of these fast flux domains, which were new that week. And we then looked at an email data set from Ironport, thank you, Henry, uh, and basically we found that uh, Ironport's data covered about 86% of the fast flux domains, but they only covered about 11% of all of the other phishing websites which surprised us no end, and that's a huge caveat on everything else I say, which is this is only 10% of the coverage. Uh, and basically what we're interested in is when did Ironport see these URLs, because Ironport does not feed data into the industry feeds or anything like this, so uh, they would see these URLs, uh, in some cases, weeks and weeks before the website became got into an industry feed, or even into one of the uh, custom feeds that we get from the specialist companies, uh, and therefore anybody was even trying to take the website down. 
Uh, and basically what we were trying to do is we were trying to look to see how much beforehand uh, the data, the spam data was being sent out. Uh, and basically we found that for the fast flux domains, the effect was almost instantaneous. As soon as the fast flux domain uh, turned up in the iron port feed, it also turned up in the industry feeds. And as soon as the website, the domain was uh, deactivated, then the fast flux domain, the domain stopped appearing in the iron port feed. Whereas for these 430 other <coughs> random sites, we were seeing the spam data turning up uh, in early August for a site which was not known to anybody else or not known to the industry as a whole uh, till the end of September. So, but at very low volumes, but weeks and weeks beforehand. And interesting, we, we also saw that some of these websites were advertised for several days after the website had actually been taken down. Probably because people had bought a spamming service which was going to send out the email, right, and that was still sending out the email even though the website had been removed. Or alternatively, they didn't even realize that their own website had been removed. So, I'm sorry. Yeah? You said the spam was being sent before, the, before we were aware of the website. Yes. Right now, if Ironport had been putting their data into the industry feed, the industry would have been aware of it weeks earlier. But because they're not, because they're hiding the data, they don't consider it relevant to put it into the industry feed, uh, then uh, they knew about it, nobody else knows about it, so the website stays up. As soon as the website is known about, for whatever reason in the, first week of, in the last week of September, then efforts are made to remove it, and it comes down after four days or four, four hours, depending on, on circumstances. And we also kind of assume here that the um, cyber criminals are booting up the fast flux domains are much more sophisticated, more likely to be professional than yes. others. Yeah, the, the, everything, all of the data I have about the fast flux operation says that they are more efficient, that they are using automated tools, and therefore they know when their domain is removed, so they're instantly turning off the spam Absolutely everything points hard at either somebody who is sitting there doing it uh, 24 hours a day, uh, people sitting at keyboards running a essentially an operation center, or alternatively highly automated systems. So it is fascinating that the less sophisticated criminals are, are not able to use spam effectively is what this shows. Yes, with the caveats that uh, they, they managed to use spam effectively enough that 90% of them failed to send any email to Ironport at all. Now, when sites are removed, obviously that uh, mitigates the impact of it. But the question is, what's doing the most harm here? Because when we actually look at the, the data here, we find that the total lifetime of all of these 4,000 websites is 20 or 1,000 hours. The total lifetime of all these fast flux domains is only 10,000 hours between them. So if you're worried about how long websites are up for, then you need to worry about these 4,000 rather than this handful of 120 uh, fast flux domains. Alternatively, if you look at the volume of spam, which we get from the Ironport data, and remember, that as far as Ironport is concerned, uh, uh, nearly 3,700 or whatever these uh, things were never advertised at all in spam, but for the rest of them, then it turns out that the ordinary ones are only th a third of all the spam, but two thirds of all the phishing e spam which Ironport saw was for these fast flux domains. Right, so almost certainly, if you turn off your spam filters and you look in your inbox, almost all two thirds of all the spam you are going to see is going to be for this fast flux stuff. So basically, if you're worried about what people see in their inboxes, then you want to worry about the fast flux guys. If you were worried about how much money they're stealing then you want to worry about the fast flux guys because spam is driving people to these websites to give away their credentials. you have data to show that both the fast flux sites and the ordinary sites are equally effective at harvesting? <clears throat> we have no idea how effective they are once they get the credentials. We have no idea uh, whether or not the emails are equally convincing. Right? Uh, certainly Henry at, at Ironport argues that the fast flux stuff is uh, the spam filters have it for breakfast He's totally unworried about that at all. It's all of these random bits and pieces which are hard to tell apart. Fast flux guys tend to use the, pretty much the same email day after day, right, with minor variations, but they're basically fighting the spam filters. Right, what gets through would be worth measuring, 
if you have data here, I'm delighted to talk to you about it. We, we, frankly, we don't know, right? I'm here to tell you, I'm telling you all sorts of really interesting things, and some of the things I'm telling you is I don't know. I've got a slide at the end which says all the things we don't know. Because if we, have, if we can assume that the fast flux sites are hosted by more professional cyber criminals, then they may be more effective. So even though they're only available for half of the no, hours, no, 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 only half, available half the time. Yes, they may be more effective, uh, and they may be better at monetizing it as well because they have the day after day volume in order to make money out of it. Uh, certainly, um, the police forces of the world believe the fast flux guys are the ones to go after. Uh, but then equally, they can't chase 4,000 different people. Uh, the chasing one gang looks attractive to them. Right, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these two uh, and just look at comparing of uh, takedown times. Because we're actually, we've done a whole lot of work here on how fast phishing websites come down. We're interested in other sorts of website. In particular, uh, if you put up a defamatory statement, right, you, you say something which is untrue about our Prime Minister, uh, then he will go to the High Court, he will get an injunction, uh, and the website will have to be removed. A bit more complicated in the US for public figures, but in the UK, believe me, you can't say untrue things about public figures. Uh, and it's believed that website removal in these cases is fairly quick, within a couple of days, maximum. Copyright violation, we've got a lot of data here. We also believe that that's fairly prompt. Uh, there's been some people running some experiments. They put up uh, uh, bits of copyright material, well, non-copyright material, as it happens from uh, sort of Dutch philosophers in the 18th century. Uh, they've then uh, written to the ISP hosting this stuff, saying, this is copyright, remove it at once, and the ISP has removed it. Well, this is perfectly rational. The ISP knows nothing about Dutch philosophy, so why wouldn't they remove it? Uh, what these people have never tried is uh, saying, well, put it back again and seeing what happens then, because then the ISP has to decide whether or not uh, between the competing things. But the interesting bit of this data is that uh, what's very clear about this is that some of, the, some of the ISPs remove the sites quite quickly, and some of them they have to send two or three emails before the site gets removed. So perseverance helps. We also have some data on what we call fake escrow agents. This is where uh, you go onto a website and you buy yourself a motorcycle uh, and the person selling you the motorcycle sends you an email and he says, well, I don't actually trust you. Um, we've never met. I'll tell you what, what I've done is I've given the motorcycle to this <coughs> delivery company who is also an escrow agent uh, and I've given them the motorcycle, you give them the money, and then they'll deliver the motorcycle to your front door. So you send the escrow company some money. That, that's it, nothing else ever happens. Right? There never was a motorcycle, it's a completely fake escrow company. The, only, the escrow companies don't do deliveries as well. Right? Delivery companies do delivery, escrow companies do escrow, nobody does both. Uh, and when we looked at the takedown time of these, we found that the average takedown time was nine days with a median of one day. Uh, though, a uh, caveat here, uh, well, this was based on some data from a mob called Artists Against 419, uh, and it turns out from uh, some, some other work we did looking at their coverage, we think they are only covering about 25% of all sites that exist. Um, but basically, the takedown is done by uh, what I call vigilantes, random people who, have, who don't have a hobby, uh, and therefore they, they track these sites and get them taken down uh, in their spare time. There are also, uh, or at least become less common now, but, but some of the money mill recruitment systems uh, where uh, people like Sydney Car Centre a couple of summers ago, if you got emails about Sydney Car Centre, uh, basically they were looking for payment processors. The idea is that you receive payments into your bank account and then you send the money to them. Uh, and uh, uh, two years ago, they were using websites quite extensively from this, so you could go and look at the Sydney Car Centre website and see they were a real company, uh, and therefore you could sign up in order to process these things. The takedown time of those was distinctly longer, average of 13 days, median of 8 days. The interesting thing about this is these are only removed by the vigilantes as well. The data suggests that these vigilantes are less, uh, less diligent about getting the websites removed, 
Uh, we speculate that this is because they're because they think that um, only an idiot uh, or somebody who's very greedy would fall for one of these. So if you have the choice between re spending your evening removing a fake escrow agent, which you know, anybody could fall for, or a money mill recruitment site, then you're going to spend your, money on the you're going to spend your time on the escrow agent first. Uh, and that suggests this. The interesting thing here is the banks are doing nothing. The banks who have these companies who can get sites removed in 4.3 hours are doing nothing about this because these money mill recruitment sites are attacking the whole industry not a particular bank, and therefore it's not their problem. Incentives. Remember, I started off with security economics. Security economics explains these data much better than anything else we know. Uh, and there are also fake pharmacies out there. And as far as we know, nobody removes those, and therefore their lifetime is around two months. We also got some data, some anonymized data from the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK. Uh, for child sexual abuse image websites. Uh, and we thought this would be the gold standard for website removal on the basis that if you're running a hosting company and somebody says that one of your customers is hosting child sexual abuse images, you're going to remove it now. You can stay late and get it removed. Where if it's a phishing page, well, maybe not. If something else complicated like a money mule recruitment where you'll leave it till Monday morning when you can work out what's going on. So we thought this would be the gold standard for removal. But interestingly, when we crunched all the numbers, we found that the takedown time was 21 days on average, with a median of 11 days. And if we include the sites which were not removed at all during the period of this study, which, is, which to be fair, makes the numbers directly comparable with the stuff on the previous slide, then we found that the removal time was 30 days and growing. Why is this? Well, the answer is that in the UK, removal is quite fast. But as soon as it goes international, what actually happens is that the Internet Watch Foundation doesn't believe that it's authorised to tell somebody in a foreign country to remove this material, so they don't. Now, Barclays, bank website, doesn't care whether or not it's authorised to ask somebody to remove a website. They just ring them up. And if they don't remove the website in four hours, they ring them up and shout at them in their, in their local language. If they don't remove the site in another four hours, they ring up the local police, shout at the local police in the local language, and so forth. They're specialist teams, but they don't seem to do this for child sexual abuse images. What they do is they pass the data to the local, uh, to, in fact, the UK police, who then move it through Interpol, uh, who, to the local police, and then it gets moved down to you know, the local sheriff or whatever who does something about it. It's not a priority to them. They possibly don't understand all of the issues. So it's very slow. Also, they're interested in catching the criminals, not in getting the stuff removed. The other thing goes on is that they will also pass the uh, data to the local member of the International Association of Hotlines. But they are extremely variable. So, for example, in the US, which hosts 60 to 80 percent of all of these sites at the moment, it's not that you're wicked people, it's just it's cheaper to host here. Uh, the the data is passed to our National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, who are the local InHope member, and they have a great policy. What they do is they look up the IP address in the ARIN database, they work out which company it is which is hosting it, and if they're a member, they tell them. If they're not a member, they throw the report away on the basis that this will encourage people to become members. And of course, it does nothing for removing the site. So there's a huge issue of incentives and confusion of aims here going on. So. Take that time on the basis of country segment. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, we didn't know the country because we were only given anonymized data. Uh, now, as it happens, I'm currently doing some work reverse engineering the list, as a result of which I may have some data on by country uh, later, and we'll see whether or not having an in-hope member does you any good. I'll watch this space. So, what do we know at present? Because the title of this talk is what we know about phishing websites now and we keep on knowing more about it and being able to explain all of the biases in our existing data. What we do know pretty much for certain is that significant funds are put at risk because of a lack of cooperation. In my view, the police are chasing the right priority gang, which is the guys running the rockfish and fast flux stuff. We know that search engines are widely used to find sites to compromise, but we don't have any really good suggestions as to what we should do with that piece of information. 
It's quite clear that takedown times are affected by incentives as much as anything else. We think that the removal of the child sexual abuse image uh, times is a complete scandal and all, something ought to be done about it. And we have no idea how many people are, how many bad guys there are. Absolutely none. We don't know whether or not it's their day job or whether or not it's something they do as a sideline in the evening. You know, when they finish their, uh, their day job uh, program making websites or indeed whether or not when they come home from school. No idea. We still don't know what the best way to disrupt phishing is, although I have some ideas. And we need lots and lots more data if we're ever going to know much more about this. And that's what we know today. The top link is our blog, which is where we put all the cool stuff we do. Uh, there's then links to uh, my and Tyler's web pages, uh, and all the papers we've written are sitting on that last URL. Thank you very much indeed. Sir. So you mentioned we don't know their day job. The cynic in me suggested that uh, the takedown companies are basically extracting, you know, protection money from the banks. And you're, you're suggesting the people who are making most money out of this are not the criminals, but the takedown companies. <laughs> um, there may be something to this, uh, in that uh, the takedown industry is not trivial. Uh, they, they've kind of grown up out of uh, an original brand protection area where they're going looking for websites selling Nike shoes, which weren't in fact Nike, that sort of thing. Uh, and they've ended up with this uh, lucrative sideline in dealing with bank phishing websites. Um, but equally, the banks pay them because there, is, there are real losses, right? Uh, and from the bank's point of view, the really dangerous thing is that people will lose confidence, right? Losing, if you're a UK bank, then losing 53 million across the industry is as nothing, right? I, I used to suggest one of the things the bank could do is not send out emails to customers at all. And, they, and the banks patiently explained to me that if their marketing departments send out an email offering home insurance to people, they make more than 53 million profit out of that one email. Right? And therefore, the suggestion that they're not going to send out email just shows what a, how to div divorce the academic world is from uh, reality. Right? Uh, so I don't suggest that anymore. Right? Uh, it, the loss may be part of the bit price of doing business, but from their point of view, what really matters is that people continue to use e-banking, because if people don't use e-banking, they'll have to go back and buy up all of the high street properties which they sold uh, in the last 10 years, making lots of money uh, from their property portfolio, and they have to go and buy those properties back again, put real, real people in them, which will cost them real money, and that really does impact the bottom line. So what they're scared of is that people will lose confidence in e-banking. Uh, and therefore, even if the criminals weren't stealing any money at all because their back-end controls were so brilliant that there was no monetary loss here, they would still need to remove the phishing websites. They would still be interested in blocking the phishing emails. Question about the past ones. Did you try to kind of group them into, like, uh, we see that there's one group that is using Rockfish, but uh, based on overlap, whether it's uh, IPs or, or name servers or whatever, did you try to group them or did like... Well, have, have we done any formal grouping? We haven't got anything published with some formal grouping. What I can tell you is that there's more than one group doing fast flux. There's a group who attacks it, many Italian banks uh, who use fast flux on, a, as far as I can see, a disjoint set of IP addresses, i.e. a different botnet. Uh, there is some doubt into my mind, in my mind whether or not we should group all of the fast flux people together or whether or not there may in fact be more than one group operating in a similar way, perhaps loosely associated, perhaps using the same set of tools, uh, but, but basically operating. And, and certainly uh, the period when they were running both the classic rockfish with the single relays and the fast flux suggests to me people, a great deal of commonality in what they were doing, suggests to me that either there was some disintermediation so that they had a, so some people sent out the spam and other people were responsible for hosting websites for this particular set of spam, right? Uh, but whether or not they were sit those people were sitting in the same room uh, and just operating things differently or whether or not they were thousands of miles apart, I wouldn't like to say. There is some, I, we, we have a lot of data, we ought to crunch it better to see whether or not we can split 
the, the generic fast flux, whether or not we, we really believe there's just one group there or not. The largest thing that's intelligence and, and what the police should be doing, but I, I would say rather than the academics. If we look at other groups, and then yes, we do see serial attackers. The group I, I labelled there is ARC. Um, basically, uh, they use a uh, similar sort of um, URL pattern with lots of fast rotating uh, values stuck into the URLs to get through email spam filters, uh, but they're using uh, single IP addresses uh, based in hosting centers. I think what they do is they just go and buy uh, hosting machines and they just point all their stuff at there. Uh, the reason we call them ARC, a dreadful thing, we, we originally called them the Little Rock Group and we needed an abbreviation so we used ARC <coughs> for Arkansas. Uh, I, don't believe they have anything to do with Arkansas whatsoever. It's just our name for them. Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of specialist little groups like that we can isolate. It's also clear when we look at the data generally is that there are distinct patterns of activity which suggests uh, clearly there is serial, serial activity. So when we remove one website, the guy in the bedroom or whatever uh, comes home from school, discovers his website is taken down, he, he compromises another machine and moves on and, and does another one. Whether or, not he comp whether or not he moves on, if we don't take them down, I don't know. That's one of the things we'd like to, to understand a bit better. Uh, and we, we are, those people, it is confused because a lot of these kids in bedrooms use the same kits which they get off the website, which they get off websites for free. Uh, in fact, those, those kits are Trojan and have back doors, so the people who put up the kits for free get a copy of all of the co compromised credentials and so forth. So there's kind of a slice across it, which is this guy called Mr. Brain, who, who puts up all of these three kits, so he's getting a whole lot of data as well, and other people are doing the work compromising the websites. Um, so uh, if, if you're the FBI, you're looking for Mr. Brain as well, because he's a nuisance. Uh, but, it, but removing Mr. Brain and locking him up is not going to make a huge impact on phishing per se. Okay. Cool so, there was a publication a few years back about uh, underground uh, economy, about how they're selling all the stuff. Like, uh, yeah, yes. uh, you, you can go and buy the kits, um, and if you go and buy them, they tend to come with guarantees and, and uh, helpline and all those sort of things people say. Um, as I say, these days you can pick up the kits for free, but they're backdoored. If you if you understand PHP, you can you can remove the backdoor and then use the kit. Um, it certainly um, what one of the things we need to understand better is how many fishes there are and what sort of structure there are, because the way in which you deal with a criminal with criminality, if you're the police, depends. Right, you deal with a mafia differently from dealing with a, an organised gang. Right, because the way you deal with a mafia is you find all the specialist tool makers and so forth and the money launderers and you take them out. There's no point in arresting Mr. Big right, and putting him away because uh, his lieutenant had been spending the previous six months trying to get up uh, enough uh, uh, cojones to, uh, to shoot him uh, and take over himself and uh, the police turn up and arrest him so his lieutenant cheers and carries on and the whole organisation carries on. So you have to disrupt the organisation. Whereas if you've got a... Uh, a, bang, a gang of bank robbers going around robbing every uh, savings and loan in South Seattle, then what you do is you try and work, you try and drink in the same place as they do, you try and work out who all the people are, and then you break all the, their doors down simultaneously uh, one Friday morning, and you arrest all of them in parallel, and your problem is gone. So you need to understand the structure of these things if you actually want to disrupt them. Right? And equally, if your problem is lots of uh, kids on street corners doing real-world criminality, then, then you have to do that by changing the environment, finding them better jobs to do, uh, and so forth. So maybe if we want to get rid of fishing, we should be spending more money in getting good jobs for people in Romania rather than uh, trying to take down all their websites. Um, you had data from my report. Did, did you uh, tell you what percentage of spam is um, fishing? Uh, no, I and Port were a little cagey about uh, any data which we can release is in the paper. Uh, so they're a little cagey as to exactly how many emails they were processing, what proportion was spam, what proportion of, of that spam was. Uh, they, they, they liked doing uh, relative numbers, they didn't like doing absolute numbers. 
just on the artwork that maybe I misunderstood, but one of the most uh, you know surprising things that you showed seemed to me that the guys who were doing the fast flux stuff, which seemed like you know, you know a very sophisticated attack, seemed to be investing so little time in getting by the spam folders. Do you have any thoughts on like why why you know someone who's so sophisticated on the network end just seems to be you know yes. using the spam tools of ten years ago? Right. The uh, it is interesting that the fast flux guys uh, who are who started with this extremely complicated URLs, right, which we, we, we've always assumed were to get through spam filters. There's no other reason for doing it. Uh, they've ended up um, having fairly innocuous URLs, which hardly change from one email to the next. Right? Uh, we assume that they do lots of measurement and feedback and so forth. Uh, the, assumption, the only assumption I can make is either that in practice they find that the emails get through for a few hours and that's long enough in order to keep up because they send a, a large amount of spam very fast, uh, that in practice enough gets through before the spam filters catch up. I, or alternatively, uh, the, what they're realizing is that spam filters are based less on URLs these days than they used to be. I would, really wouldn't like to say, uh, I suspect if you, if you get a spam filter guy in the room, uh, we can probably try and work out what's changed in spam filters over the last couple of years, which means that that's more effective. Right, because it sounded like you know, people at Ironport thought that this was not a problem, the spam filters would take care of it. But, you know, yeah, the, Ar the, Ar the Ironport guys think the spam filters have the rockfish stuff, the fast flux stuff for breakfast, right, once they know of the domain. Right, um, but, but equally, I don't think we've actually pressed them on whether or not they know about it within 10 minutes or 45 minutes. And equally, they're kind of specialists in terms of providers. We might be more interested in how well Comcast filters do. Rather than, rather than looking at a specialist mail provider such as Microsoft or Google or Yahoo, I, who, are, who are very different. I, and certainly if I was a spammer, I would not bother trying to send email to message labs, to our import and so forth, because I, I, I'd say, well, not, I don't think that's my market. I want to write to people at home, which, and uh, that means I want to write to, to random ISPs. So I think looking at the effectiveness of random ISP spam filters might be more, more interesting than looking at the effective, effectiveness of Hotmail's spam filters. Should we end it there and thanks for one more time?